think the fundamental is that Liz Truss came in with a big, bold experiment. She absolutely pressed the button and launched the thing just after the period of mourning for the death of the Queen. And as far as the markets are concerned, as far as most, I think it's fair to say, of her MPs are concerned. And it would appear the opinion polls uh, suggest the public as well. It has not gone at all well, to the point that this could be the shortest premiership we've known. Gary Gibbon, I guess I wanted to start by saying or asking, really, you know, you've been in the business a long time. You've seen prime ministers, party leaders, cabinets, ministers come and go. But this turbulent opening month for Liz Truss, along with the fact that we lost the longest reigning monarch. I mean, these past weeks, there must have been an extraordinary period for you to report on. It's without precedent in uh, my time uh, covering politics, but... You would have to go a very long way back to find anything like this. To have a prime minister have to deal um, almost immediately upon uh, taking office with the death of a long-serving monarch was pretty extraordinary. But then we've had Liz Truss post uh, the period of mourning for Queen Elizabeth II. And my goodness, uh, I've never seen anything like that either. We've quickly moved to a position where a new prime minister has a giant question mark just a month in office next to their viability, uh, next to their longevity, uh, next to their ability to govern at all. Was it always going to be difficult anyway? This was a poison challenge. This was a party that was unpopular after um, Boris Johnson's tenure. We obviously knew there was the cost of living crisis, the war in Ukraine. Was it always going to be a difficult job anyway? Yes, it was. And and that peppered the, the leadership contest, really. We had an extraordinary cost of living crisis, as you say, uh, layered on top of all sorts of other sort of longer term difficulties with the British economy, what people call the productivity puzzle. Why why can't we uh, e- extract uh, growth from uh, the labour force at a rate that other countries seem to manage? Uh, the trade deficit, the fact that we seem to be importing quite a bit more than we're exporting, some underlying questions about the British economy that weren't going away, and uh, not a lot of fresh extra cash on the horizon to deal with it. So there were all sorts of questions around, plus the aftermath of the Boris Johnson uh, premiership, in which the Conservative Party had descended into uh, full-scale civil war and had eventually managed to push uh, this, at one time, seemingly rather popular uh, Prime Minister off his perch against his will, uh, and he he slung off uh, down Downing Street, resenting what they'd done to him. It wasn't a uh, it wasn't going to be a great uh, incoming uh, uh, treat for any prime mm. minister, but uh, boy, no, none of us could have quite foreseen what Liz Truss has done with that extremely difficult inheritance. Gary, last time we spoke, and you just mentioned it there, we were talking about Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss um, battling it out for the leadership and, of course, uh, the prime minister position. We had several weeks of hustings around the country. In the end, Liz Truss, as we know, she won. She got... of the vote of the members. Now, that was a lower percentage than her predecessors, such as Boris Johnson, Theresa May, David Cameron. And, of course, she never had um, as many MPs backing her as Rishi Sunak. In that result, and what we know about the MPs, were there those early warning signs of what might come? Yeah, I don't think it's hindsight to say there were early warning signs of trouble ahead. Uh, Liz Truss, I just went to uh, double-check the figures uh, for you, got 50 MPs uh, in the first ballot. So Mm -hmm. she was 50 MPs first choice. That's out of 358 uh, who voted. Uh, I can't remember anybody uh, um, governing securely on the basis of that kind of uh, first round effort. And what the Rishi Sunak supporters uh, ended up feeling was also that they'd been slightly cheated by the polls of the party members. The opinion polling of party members gave Liz Truss a bigger lead than she actually ended up with. They feel that their man was closer on Liz Truss's tail than the polls were suggesting and could have made up that gap uh, if the polls had been more accurate and Tory party members had felt there really was uh, game on here, uh, there was a chance that Rishi Sunak could win. 
Who can say? Uh, Liz Truss's people would uh, understandably poo-poo all of that. But that was the kind of uh, uh, unreconciled grumpiness with mm. which an awful lot of Rishi Sunak supporters embraced the new leadership. And uh, that's only got worse in the last few weeks. Looking at the current state of affairs, where we are now, is the argument that this is what those members who voted for Liz Truss wanted in terms of why did she win that leadership race? And is this current mini budget and its consequences, is that actually what was on paper? It probably goes a bit further than what was said in the campaign, but it's very much uh, the direction of travel that Liz Truss promised the members and the platform on which the 80,000 members who voted for her uh, backed her. And you'll remember, of course, that during that campaign in the summer, uh, Rishi Sunak uh, coined it fairy tale economics. And he's been keeping his counsel, quietly staying away from uh, microphones uh, since uh, Liz Truss won the leadership. But plenty of his supporters are saying, uh, if not in front of microphones, all of them, certainly in my ears and, uh, and, and in the ears of other uh, reporters, that this is fairy tale economics on steroids. What Liz Truss did with that uh, mini budget was add to the unfunded uh, tax cuts, which she'd promised uh, she would say, in one case in particular, in a couple of cases, not increasing a tax that uh, was going to be increased rather than a tax cut. But nonetheless, a low tax programme which wasn't uh, funded and was based on borrowing, uh, she added to the list and her critics would say, and an awful lot of independent observers would say, that is what has created the panic in the markets. Did Liz Truss miss a trick in the sense that you know, every Tory leadership contest is bruising and they and every individual says, you know, when they win, if they do win, that they will unite the party. Given the fact that she didn't really bring any Sunak supporters into her cabinet at all, given that some of those voices, if she had some, might have questioned some of the mini-budget, did she miss a trick there in terms of unity as well as the policies going forward? It was pretty unusual to be quite as uh, blatant about not having people from the other side in your team. And it creates a really bad atmosphere at the very beginning of an administration. And if we go back to that number, if, you, if you've only had 14% uh, of MPs backing you in the first round, you probably do need to make a few, uh, a few friends and, and reach out. And she did nothing of the sort. And then just days after Truss became party leader and prime minister, and just as she was beginning to outline her new vision and her new policies, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II passed away at the age of 96. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Her reign lasted for 70 years from post-war austerity... That didn't just mean that Liz Truss had to address the nation and announce the death of Her Majesty. It also meant that she had to put her policies on hold. All the workings of Whitehall had to be paused for the official 10 days of national mourning. There are many things that will now happen that people haven't seen in this country for a long time that are dictated by protocol, custom, some of them by law, and we will be seeing those unfold during a period of mourning. And so my question for Gary is, how much of a shock was that moment for this government? And did it really throw them off course? It, it, it will have been a huge shock. There's no getting away from that. But I think quite a lot of people feel, well, actually, the focus is somewhere else at this point. The business of government goes on. This gave Liz Truss and her team a very rare moment uh, when they didn't have to give account of themselves, didn't have mm -hmm. to indulge in daily uh, politics. They could have worked out, test, road tested, perfected uh, their policies and how they were going to be presented. And you hear quite a lot of her colleagues saying they feel that wasn't done. And Gary, after the, the period of mourning, Truss's team obviously finally got going and we saw the release of the mini budget from the Chancellor. Now, I think we all know what's happened in, in the weeks after. We've seen the markets get spooked, the pound crashed, um, it raised the cost of borrowing for the government. The fallout continues. But Gary, explain to me where that thinking comes from. I know there was a book about a decade ago called Britannia Unchained, where I think both um, Liz Truss and Quasi Kwarteng wrote articles. I mean, where does this thinking come from? Is this an ideology? Yes, it is. They reject entirely the uh, name that was given uh, to Reagan's uh, economic uh, experiment, trickle-down uh, economics. It's a term of abuse which President Biden uh, is using at the moment against his Republican 
uh, opponents. But that is what quite a lot of uh, MPs, even Tories, uh, call uh, Liz Truss's experiment. Quite a lot of people point out that what President Reagan uh, was doing was uh, uh, different in the sense you can you, you can get away with uh, the sort of uh, borrowing on the markets uh, that Liz Truss is attempting to do if you're a reserve currency like the dollar. Uh, if you're a, a currency that people don't have to, uh, f don't feel they have to hold, uh, and which they can very freely sell, uh, it's not so easy. And all that sort of stuff should have been thought out. Also, uh, there are uh, some bits of the uh, Thatcherite experiment that are in here, um, which obviously was uh, being undertaken around the same time uh, uh, as the British cousin of the Reagan uh, experiment. But people who worked with Margaret Thatcher, old soldiers who remember uh, that uh, administration, uh, say, well, the thing about, Mar well, some of them do, the thing about Margaret Thatcher was that she quite often compromised, and there wasn't that spirit of compromise in Liz Truss's mini-budget. So there is quite a lot of ideology here, and people who've known Liz Truss over the years, former cabinet ministers who've had to work with her in cabinet committee, say she is a very ideologically driven individual. Uh, this is someone who, uh, people talk about her joining the Liberals when she was at uh, university. She joined the Hayek Society when mm. she was at university. Now, that, I suspect, wasn't a, a, a stall at the Freshers' Fair with a lot of freebies. <laughs> uh, that was one you had to really look out and, and, and feel passionate about. Mm. And that is where she comes from. She believes passionately in a smaller state. She believes that taxes hold countries back. And, that, and she came in with a burning ambition uh, to really push that experiment, which she thought other leaders had slightly uh, forgotten. Because can you go into that just a bit, uh, Gary, in terms of how that ideology then morphs itself into policy? You mentioned um, Hayek there, Friedrich von Hayek, the economist who was the, the sort of, I guess, the father of, of Reaganomics and, and, and Thatcherite policies. How does that, what does that look like on paper when it comes to the mini budget? What this trust feels she has presented to the country um, is a programme of reducing taxes, starting on a journey of reducing taxes, she would like it to go a lot further, and side by side with it, what are called supply side economic changes. And that's a whole programme of work that involves cutting back on regulations, helping businesses make money, she would say, and, and helping economic growth, trying to speed up planning, whether it's for housing, whether it's for uh, businesses like energy, uh, and cutting back on strikes. She would see that as part of the supply side reforms that she wants to bring. There's a whole bundle of these things which she hopes to roll out. This was actually nicknamed Operation Rolling Thunder in Downing Street meetings uh, when they were talking about how they'd roll out all these uh, plans which would transform the economy, liberate business and boost growth. Well, uh, it's, it's not looking like that now <laughs> because uh, the mini budget has knocked the legs away from uh, Liz Truss's credibility and is going to make it incredibly difficult for her to get uh, a, quite a lot of these uh, measures past her own party. But in terms of that Operation Rolling Thunder, you know, Truss always said, I'm prepared to be unpopular. Did they expect the markets and to what, what's happened now to happen in some form or another? Or have they really been shocked themselves by what's happened? They've been shocked. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know uh, whether that's because officials who, in normal circumstances, would have warned uh, a chancellor and a prime minister that markets won't like massive unfunded measures, whether those officials did give their warnings and uh, they weren't listened to, or whether because there was a certain zealotry about the, uh, the incoming administration, the fact that the senior civil servant uh, at the Treasury had been summarily dismissed uh, as uh, the new government came in, whether that sent out a signal that just cowed uh, people a little and they didn't feel uh, that uh, anything that challenged uh, the mission, the great experiment, uh, would, would be welcome, uh, should be heard. Either way, they were surprised uh, and there have been all sorts of raised voices inside Downing Street, we're told, uh, about whose fault that was. Uh, should Kwasi Kwarteng have been uh, rolling the pitch a bit more uh, before this all happened? Uh, Liz Truss has said the government should have done. Uh, some people suggest in private she's actually pointed the uh, finger very much at her own chancellor. Mm. And uh, relations often uh, go awry between chancellors and prime ministers, but goodness, I can't remember them going, going awry mm. in a matter of weeks.
And talking about that, um, the difference there, the disputes between the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, we saw the the U-turn over the top rate of tax. They were going to cut it from 45p to 40. They then didn't. They said they got it. They'd listened. It was a distraction. Gary, you sat down with the Prime Minister herself at conference. Did she get it? And what did you take away from that interview? The Prime Minister was at great pains in that interview, all the interviews um, she gave that day, to say that the biggest thing that happened in the budget was the help on energy bills. And in terms of numbers, it was. Uh, but that wasn't the uh, that wasn't the controversial bit of what she was doing, and she opted to go ahead with some unfunded tax cuts, and that's what spooked the markets. Well, what we needed to do is act quickly, because if you remember, people were facing energy bills of up to six thousand pounds. Businesses were facing going out of business, and we had a slowing global economy and very high inflation rates. And what our package did, which is a combination of the energy price guarantee and the tax reductions, is help deal with those issues, meaning that households weren't paying more than a typical mm. £2,500 on their energy, which was the biggest part of the package. Absolutely. And also that we were dealing with inflation because the energy package also reduced inflation by up to 5%. What I came away with was that she was... Um, trying to lash those two um, bits of the package together to make the tax cuts look better because they happened the same time as something else that was more widely accepted in politics and more widely accepted in the, in the markets. Um, but I don't think it's over with the end of the top rate. Uh, I, you sense, looking at the markets, listening to Tory MPs, that they're convinced that if she can hold out until the new earlier date now of the 31st of October, when the Chancellor's going to present his medium-term fiscal plan, another sort of mini-budget, as it were, if she can hold out till then, she's going to have to do away with more than just the idea of abolishing the top rate. She's going to have to reverse some other of those tax cut measures that were in that budget. That's a conclusion that an awful lot of her own MPs are coming to, and the pressure from the markets... Well, it's not quite of Greek proportions going back to the EU crisis, but it, but, but it does feel as though even if you get a temporary lull, they just come back. It's coming in waves mm. and it doesn't feel like it's subsiding. And talking about where we are now as well as back at conference, what, what is that mood from the party itself, from, from the MPs on the back benches? Are they reacting not just to the markets and the concerns around the economy? Is it also because... You know, they're looking at the poll numbers as well and seeing that Labour could be 30 points up. I mean, what was the mood from conference? Because it seems like we're still seeing that on the backbenches this week. I would say at the beginning of Liz Truss's short premiership, <laughs> there was a spirit, I think the dominating spirit, I would say, amongst Tory backbench MPs was disengagement. People were beginning to polish up their CVs, probably thought they might lose their seats or retire at the next general election. That has migrated, I would say, to a, a mood of menace. And uh, there are more MPs uh, now who are hostile uh, to Liz Truss and are thinking that if she stays in place, the party could have a, a defeat from which it would take a very, very long time uh, to mm. come back. And they're beginning to talk to each other. Conversations are starting about how... And again, this is another change I've watched. I would say the conversation a few weeks ago was about how they were going to, uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of that budget, was how they were going to sort of lash her down with ropes like Gulliver and Lilliput and, and, and sort of con contain her, not let her, uh, not let this trust do some of the, as they would see it, the wilder or more unpopular uh, mm. things that she might uh, want to do. There is still that discussion around, and it's it's very active around Westminster. But I would say uh, there are more and more MPs you meet who have gone to the next level and are actually saying, we might look ridiculous if we go for another leader yet again, but I think we're going to have to do it. And well, it's quite a lot of them saying that. Well, just in terms of where the trust government goes now in terms of the economic picture, I guess on the one hand, they're either double down. On the other hand, they're going to have to do more U-turns. On the first point, you know, we saw Jacob Rees-Mogg, the business secretary, 
trying to do that, saying that it's not the mini budget that's causing this problem. It's got to do with the global issues, the war in Ukraine, you know, interest rates, mortgage rates, the inflation. It was higher before. Does that work? Is that going to wash with voters or have they already baked in the idea that the problems right now have been exacerbated by this government? I keep asking pollsters about this because you see the headline numbers mm. suggesting that Liz Truss is uh, breathtakingly unpopular and her government. Um, and, and I keep asking what are the main drivers here? Was it, say, something like losing the 45p rate, which makes the Conservatives look like, some people would argue, a, a party that is uh, you know, leaning towards helping out the rich rather than the poor and the rest of it? That was how it was being portrayed by its uh, critics. Is it that, that that's driving the polls or is it an underlying impression of incompetence and losing the mantle of economic uh, competence which the Tories have always uh, treasured uh, and, and hoped to hold and I am told by pollster after pollster it is very much the latter and that is lethal because even if you ping back some of the u-turn on some of these measures like the 45p rate that still still leaves this idea that you took a risk an unnecessary risk and a harmful risk with the British economy when you were in charge of it. And it it does look as though the Tories have lost their uh, mantle of competence with the uh, voters, and that's going to be incredibly difficult to get back. Once lost, political history teaches us it's lost for quite a while. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think that that is what is terrifying Tory MPs right now. And if they therefore don't dig in and defend this mini-budget, and they do go down what has been mooted as, as U-turns. I mean, what would that mean? I mean, because, you know, we're looking ahead um, to the end of October when they have to explain, you know, how they're going to fund these tax cuts. You know, the Institute for Fiscal Studies says, you know, you're going to have to have essentially painful cuts. Liz Truss says that won't happen. So it, it feels like they're digging themselves into, into a corner here, aren't they? I'm told there's... A, I'm not very good at uh, chess. I'm told there's an expression called zugs, zug swam, uh, <laughs> where every move you make is horrible. Uh, and uh, and you, mm. you, you go, that's that's where it feels like right now for the Tory party. Do you go towards uh, U-turns? Well, then everybody's going to say you can't govern. Uh, do you go towards spending cuts? Well, everybody's going to say we've cut quite enough and that wasn't what was in the 2019 Tory manifesto and it certainly wasn't on the side of the bus in the 2016 uh, Brexit referendum. Where do you go? Uh, do you depose? Uh, in which case you have uh, the embarrassment of uh, yet uh, going for yet another leader without consulting the British uh, electorate. All the choices seem to bring with them uh, a set of horrors. And the Tory MPs I've been speaking to in the last few days are looking for the least horrible option. But the fundamental here is that as of that budget and the reaction to the mini budget, uh, Liz Truss can't govern. Mm. Uh, she doesn't have a majority uh, of, of the House of Commons. And that moment at the Tory party conference when Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee, went to tell her that she had to uh, uh, get rid of the abolition of the 45p, she had to re reinstate the 45p uh, tax level, that was a very, very important moment because that wasn't the chief whip coming to tell her, oh, we've got to have a bit of a problem with this vote. That was the head of the 1922 committee coming to tell her. Mm -hmm. And you've got to remember the role that he has played uh, in the past. He's the guy who stands there and says, this party has no confidence in you. When he goes to see a prime minister, it means there is a climate of opinion that mm -hmm. is moving in that dangerous direction. And goodness, I mean, that was... That was barely three weeks in. Just on what happens next, Gary, in terms of, you know, what Tory backbenchers are thinking about Liz Truss. I mean, firstly, is there any talk about the way they elect leaders itself? The fact that, you know, it's the members who chose this leader over the MPs. That's come up in almost every single conversation really? I've had with the yep. Tory MP. And those Tory MPs who are currently thinking they might have to ditch Liz Truss, uh, maybe sooner rather than later are gaming how you do it in a way that blocks out the membership and makes mm. sure that they don't have a say in this whole thing. And they're talking, quite a few of them, about how there might need to be a coronation, an, uh, an unopposed leader on which you have a sufficient mass of uh, MPs uh, agreed upon uh, that you uh, cut, cut out, carve out uh, the membership, and you also carve out um, any chance of a, a ballot amongst MPs. Uh, and you could do this by getting the... Uh, 
1922 committee to say you need, say, I'm going to pluck a number from the air now, there are 100 nominations in order mm. to be a candidate. And there'll be only one person who could get that because everyone will have cooked up a conspiracy around, you know, promoting one particular uh, candidate. So, yes, it comes up all the time. And there's, um, I can't think of many, I can't think of a single Tory MP I've spoken to recently mm. uh, who hasn't worried that having members choose a leader mid-term isn't a problem. And there's obviously, there's always... Um, speculation about whether Boris Johnson is sort of sitting somewhere loving all this and thinking this could be him returning. I've also read about, you know, Rishi Sunak being mooted as a sort of caretaker leader. I mean, what's the idea about who that person would be? Would it be a, a caretaker leader like Michael Howard after Ian Duncan Smith, who, you know, they understand they'll probably lose the next election, but it's sort of saving face and preparing for the next one? I think it's much more in the mould in which, you, you, as you call it, the Michael Howard uh, precedent... There's a feeling amongst Tory MPs that if you are going to try and carve out the membership and leave them out of the choice of the next leader, you can't elect someone like Rishi Sunak, who they've just rejected. Mm. In fact, a lot of them are saying you can't actually have one of the people who was a candidate in the last contest. You can't have, uh, to go back um, uh, a, a couple of contests, you can't have Jeremy Hunt, who they rejected uh, once before. You've got to play that fairly carefully mm. and somehow come up with some sort of dream unity candidate who allows you to have a critical mass of MPs, carve out the membership and maybe save you some seats in either a close contest or a defeat or or a narrow victory at the next general election. Every time we've spoken on this podcast, we've talked about sort of the post-Brexit Tory party struggling with its identity. And so at the moment, you seem to have the sort of the, the backbench, compassionate, one nation conservatives. You seem to have Liz Truss, the Thatcherite, the growth, growth, growth. And then you have... You know, I think of someone like uh, Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, who's going on about immigration, woke police forces, going all in on culture wars. Isn't that the issue here? It's, it, it's basically a Tory party still struggling to unite all those factions. And an awful lot of the Tory party members thought they'd found the winning formula. They were going back to a Thatcher-style leader with some uh, Thatcher-type uh, economic policies uh, with Liz Truss seems to be, uh, in the formulation that Liz Truss has presented, falling apart in front of us. You've mentioned Suella Braverman a, a, a few times. Interestingly, quite a lot of Tory MPs think if there were a contest and the members had a say, uh, Suella Braverman would uh, walk it now because uh, she's, she's saying a lot of the things that the uh, members want to hear. I think the answer is that there are an awful lot of uh, centre-right parties in the democracies of the world that are a broad church, um, that have authoritarian wings, as it were, small a, uh, libertarian uh, wings, and, and, and wrestle with smaller state versus actually a more sort of Christian Democrat approach to uh, the size of the state. Uh, it's not the Tory party alone uh, that mm. wrestles with this, uh, but this has been a, a, a triumph for one wing of the party um, in, in the Liz Truss election, and goodness is it short-lived. And you've got to wonder whether the party's uh, really going to want to, the MPs are going to really want to try an experiment of this kind uh, anytime soon. Gary Gibb.